even if you think you're always gonna be in parks, you just never know, things, things happen. So that was kind of catastrophic because I don't know how to do museums. <laughs> Challenge on. Get your rig all set up to go do everything that you want to do. And I just didn't want lithium to be a stumbling block. They invented the plane. This video is gonna be a little different than usual. Before we wrap up our time in the Outer Banks, we just wanna sit down with you guys and share some things that we've learned about solar in the last four and a half years of being on the road. Today we're talking about the four stages of solar and how it will help you guys be able to get where you wanna be, not just someday, but right now. Okay, so I wanted to get on here and clarify what I said in last episode about solar. I think some people thought that I did not recommend lithium, and I just didn't want lithium to be a stumbling block. Mm -hmm. Where lead acid works, lithium is better, but we wanted to get on here and take the time to, to clarify that and just describe what we've been able to accomplish in the last four years with our setup. So I believe, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, it's gonna vary depending on your rig, depending on your knowledge level, depending on your energy needs. But this is my recommendations, this is my opinion of what I believe are the four stages of solar setups. Okay, so stage one would be basically what we've done up until season six on our channel. So everything you've seen up to season six, we've done on stage one. And that stage one is we always recommend at least two lead acid batteries. We use the Everstart 29DC. Uh, I think it's great. There are 115 amp hours. We have two of them. We've been able to do so much with those batteries and they're $90 at just about every Walmart. And beyond that, we have a 1500 watt inverter. So you can run at least like, I run my air compressor on it because I, I like to have a tank and you'll have the ability to run, you know, some of your appliances too. So mm -hmm. if you don't want to do that, you could get away with thousand or 700 watt inverter but I like the 1500. And last but not least, probably you want this before the batteries even. <laughs> you need a generator. You, yeah. really, you really just need a generator. Uh, so I recommend something at least 2000 watts. Um, and it's gotta be an inverter. And those range from, you know, $400 for something from Harbor Freight, the Predator or, or the Champion or something. Right. They're around $400. What we have is the Honda 2200i, which is around $1,000. At the time, the Honda was the quietest. Now everybody's kind of copied them and they're mm -hmm. all so quiet now. Yeah, and one of the things that he mentioned before about, about having the generator is that even if you think you're always gonna be in parks, there are situations that come up where we have actually yep. experienced uh, a transistor blowing up at a campground and there were people that had children in their RV in a very hot situation that had no generator, no power, no ability to actually do anything in their yeah, RV they, because they, they just planned on being in campgrounds all the time. The guy needed a CPAP machine and he was up all night because he didn't go, dare go to sleep because they had no battery power. So that's why you need at least two batteries. You need a generator. Even if you think you're always going to be in parks, you just never know. Things things happen. It's just to be prepared. And you never know who you could help with one as well. All right, so let's talk some costs. I'll, I'll try to give some sort of a cost uh, breakdown for each one, but it's, it's, it's vary. so variable. But for this stage, you're looking at, you know, 730 to 1,030, you know, roughly. Uh, I know it's not roughly, I said 30, but those are just the numbers I came up with. And obviously that swing is depending on the generator that you pick. Okay, so one other bonus item, you don't need it, but it's been handy to have. We have a solar generator. We have a Jackery 500 that I think is really useful no matter what your setup is. You can bring it to the beach, you can bring it to the park, you can go work you know, away from the RV someplace mm -hmm. and have power. So that's a, that's a bonus item. You don't necessarily need it, but it is handy. And all items that we discuss in the video will be linked in the description below. And another note, technically for stage one, we had portable solar panels. We had two that we would get out every once in a while, but I will tell you, we very rarely got them out because right. of, you know, there's so much involved with that. 
you're worried about if you drive away, is someone gonna just swipe them? So theft. Uh, mm -hmm. If if the wind's going, you're usually have them on an angle and they'll blow over. And so you're and constantly looking out the window to make sure they're still in the position that they were in before. You're constantly adjusting them. You're constantly moving around. You have to remember to put them out, and you're not charging while you're going down the road. There's so many negatives to it. Um, I, I they're they're good. But if you're gonna, if I was to do it over and spend the money on something, I would much rather just put something on the roof. And it's so easy on the newer rigs because they're solar prepped or there's a solar panel up there already right. and you just have to daisy chain off of it. So until you see a need where you definitely need some sort of portable solar panel, put the money on the roof first. All right, so stage two, this is where I wanna really clarify things. I thought stage three and two were swapped. I thought you needed lithium first before you even messed with solar. And that is just not the case. As we found out by you know experimenting with these stages, we have 660 watts of solar with lead acid batteries. And we were able to boondock the entire time on the outer banks. It was over three weeks, we never fired the generator up. We had espressos in our mm -hmm. espresso machine. We charged all of our laptops, we watched TV. We did everything that you normally would do um, and it just stayed fully charged, even with lead acid batteries. Exactly, the only thing that we didn't do is that we didn't run the AC, but that was part of the reason why we stayed in the Outer Banks during the time that we did, because the weather was perfect. I'm gonna talk about AC kind of at the end of this and kind of explain AC. That's a whole other animal. So besides the 660 watts we have, we have four Furion 165 watt panels. You need a solar charge controller. Uh, so that's just gonna take the power from your panels and convert it to 12 volts. So that's another thing that you're gonna need. Well, the variable on pricing on that is the solar panels you choose. So we're gonna have a link to the, to the ones that I recommend right now um, in the description. But to get three, four panels up there and then to get your solar charge controller, you're talking about $1,000. So say roughly $1,000. Um, that gets you a lot more bang for the buck Absolutely. than just say one lithium battery. That's where we made our big mistake. Uh, there is obviously, and we're going to add bonus items. This is this is where the variables come in. It depends on what you like, what right. your needs are. My bonus item for stage two would be a battery monitor, and I have the Victron 500 amp, and it's just the numbers. I just love to follow the numbers, so <laughs> it's like $150. Like, um, get the battery monitor. Yeah, what what are what's we doing? going on? What's you know? coming in today? Yeah. So you don't need it, but I think it's fun. All right. So stage three, um, and I'm going to mention this again because I mean. I'm not really good with explaining things. So it's gonna be more <laughs> detailed in the description, you know, all these all these stages where right. you can just read about it and not not hear my silly thoughts. So <laughs> if you don't if you wanna stop now, you can just go look at the description. <laughs> <laughs> so it's up it's up to you so stage three and this is where lithium comes in and this is where there's a lot of cost that right. lithium can be a lot so i'm going to go right up front with the cost just to get two lithium batteries i mean it could be upwards of two thousand dollars and that's just for a couple and then however many more you need that's a big big cost right and then you talk about ac i'm going to keep mentioning this i guess if you're talking about ac it's a really big cost. If you're trying to, to run your AC through the night, you're talking 800 or 1,000 amp hours of battery. That's a lot of money. It's a big investment. My goal, personally, with AC is just to be able to run it a couple hours. Say we get back from a hike or something and it's not quite cooled off for the evening yet and we just wanna take the edge off and run it for a couple hours. So that's my goal with AC. And that's that's what yeah. we chase for weather. That's the point of full-time RV travel. You are chasing the right weather mm -hmm. and you do that by going up north and you do that by going up in elevation. And we've really been able to accomplish that for the most part in our entire travel. The travels. whole time we've been traveling. So, when we know we're not gonna be able to chase the weather, that's when we're in RV parks. You're plugged in anyways. So like I said, the price ranges, you know, 2000 plus, because you're probably gonna to need to change out your converter as well that charges lithium um, instead of just lead acid. All right, so I'm kind of doing this in a roundabout way, but what are the benefits of lithium? Is it all hype? No, it's not. Lithium's awesome. really amazing. They physically last longer. They're more dependable. They charge faster um, and they're really just cool. <laughs> so say you had a lead acid battery bank and it, it might take you all day long to finish it off to 100%. Lithium could do that same charge capacity in like an hour or something because it physically can accept more power to it. So lithium, lithium is better. 
superior in every way. So as far as the stages go, nothing is wasted except for the two lead acid batteries you buy uh, and maybe the inverter, but those are low cost items. Mm -hmm. That'll get your feet wet. That will get you an idea of how you even RV. Right. Is it even beneficial to you? We've talked to so many people that have invested in the full setup all the way to stage four and they've never used it. Right. But they just, they have that fear because there's a lot of unknowns. That's why we really recommend doing this as stages. Right. You learn along the way and you learn how you're going to RV um, and you just, you find your limit. All right, so stage four, that is just the fully automated system. Do you need it? Not really. Do you want it? Definitely, Absolutely. because everything <laughs> is automatic. You don't think about anything, and but that's when a lot of the cost comes in. That's when possibly some of the DIY aspects of this kind of go out the window. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to actually dig into the electrical system or you just don't feel comfortable, mm -hmm. because you are replacing you know, your main power sources at this point. Right. There's a lot more wiring involved. There's a lot more like smaller components that are involved. And I mean, that's a minimum. So this is minimum of $3,000 to go to this stage on top of everything else you spent. Right. So what are some of those extra components? Well, the main component would be something like the Victron Multi Plus. We actually have the Victron Multi Plus 2 3000 watt and it's not installed yet. Right. Because we're trying to do this in stages so we learn right along with you guys in that I can actually say you know, something in form. So what that does is that handles your power. So that's your inverter, your converter, mm -hmm. and all of that in one piece. Say you're plugged into um, a house socket, it's only 15 amp. That will pull whatever you want off the house. You can say, stop, don't, don't trip that breaker, and then pull the excess that you need off of your battery bank. So you essentially have unlimited power. Right, it's like adding a brain to, to the system. That's the automated stuff that we're talking about. And the variables are huge. Are you gonna do it yourself? Do you have to hire somebody? Right. How many lithium batteries are you gonna have? There's just a lot There's of variables. There's a lot, there's a lot. Uh, and that's where I think it gets confusing to people because people look at stage four as the only stage. Right. And that is not the only stage. Uh, and I think we've beat that kind of to death. <laughs> We beat it to death. So we're currently in stage three. We have four line energy UT1300 batteries. We're pumped with them. Uh, and we can't wait to move to stage four, but we want to, we, like we said, we want to do this in stages. We just want to make sure that you guys are aware and understand that it is not, it does not have to be so overwhelming to get all the way there. And I think like what he was saying before, if you do go through the stages, you're learning as you go. And then stage four actually may not be as overwhelming and you may have learned enough that you can start doing some of those things. And for those who can, who can financially handle it, like, Stage four is a great option, like for sure, get your rig all set up to go do everything that you want to do. But if it's not as financially feasible, don't let it keep you from going out and finding your someday and doing what you want to do with your family and making memories. So that's why we wanted to share with you these stages and wanted to make sure that you guys could go and do exactly what you want to do. All right, we are on the move again. We are at Oregon Inlet Campground and we are exiting the Outer Banks. We are going to our last campground in the Outer Banks. We have a few more cool things we're gonna do. We're gonna check out the, uh, the Air Museum and one of my buddies is actually in a competition in Kitty Hawk for hand gliding. So, so we're cool. gonna go see him. Right now we're gonna go see the Wright Brothers Museum. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we can't check into our next campground for another few hours, so we're just going to leave here and just pull this into it instead of, I don't know, we're just, just trying to use around. our time wisely. But that's one of the really awesome things that you guys can check out as you're traveling. There are a ton of National Park Visitor Centers that have RV parking and this is one of them, so it's totally fine that we're still attached and we can get something done and then we can head off to our campground. It's perfect. Daddy. Hey, hey. <laughs> Hookups for the first time in oh, two weeks. I know, it's gonna be nice. Hopefully it's better than our last for failed attempt. For longer than a couple hours. <laughs> that, uh, it's gonna be perfect. If the sewer doesn't work in this one, I've given up on I know, on all we're only RV boondocking parks. for the rest of our lives. Touch everything. We tell people all the time. I touch every single drawer, door, oven, 
just to make sure. Just to make sure. Okay, I think we're good. So it's funny, when we first pulled up, we were about here in the truck and we saw the site and I was like, there's no way we're fitting because there was all sorts of stuff over here, but we fit in just fine. Obviously, the truck is hanging out now because we're hooked up. We just had it at an angle before, but it's deceiving. We fit. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm just gonna get the truck now. Okay. We are definitely getting spoiled by these 45 minute or 20 minute drive days. That's all about the end. The harsh reality of uh, RVing is going to come back to us here pretty soon. Very quickly. Uh, when we make our trip up to Maine. So we just found out that Lily got her test date back. The way Maine does it, you send in your Our application yep. and then they send you a random date back. So we just got it that means we have to cut this trip a little bit short and we're going to shoot up to Maine very soon in the oh, next couple there. days uh, for Lily to just a uh, new great. life milestone coming up. <laughs> License. We are, we're going to go check out that monument. I guess that's the original dune, but it is since grassed over. So they put a monument up there. But first we're going to go check out the, uh, the visitor center. Did you talk about how amazing these RV spots are? Oh, yeah, this is one of the long. first RV sites that we actually just fit into. We don't usually have to cockeye the truck a little bit, but there's more than enough room. We're 56-ish feet. I'm guessing it's, it's long, plenty of room. Since we're not very good at filming um, museums, we have a new plan. Everybody's gonna find their favorite thing and talk a little bit about it, because I don't know how to do museums. <laughs> Challenge on. Challenge. Challenge on. The white brothers, they grew up in a very uh, tight-knit, very loving family. Uh, their father built it. He was a bishop, a uh, very strong-willed, virtuous man. I think he instilled that character in all, in all their kids. Her mother, Susan, she was a, probably a woman ahead of her time. Uh, she was well-educated. Uh, she went to college. She had to figure out four problems of life. And that could be lift. That's how you got to get off the ground. Uh, control, because you want to control your plane, of course. And then power and thrust. All right, so check out these buildings. These are pretty exact to what the originals were because obviously they have photos. That's crazy. So the sand. These, these two buildings right here are here, but I don't know if you can see, there's no grass, no. there's no trees. That's how much the landscape has changed since they flew here. It's amazing. The ranger said this was literally a beach. So it was all sand dune and sand and it was like coming off the ocean like a beach, which actually feels like that's where we are right now because it is so singing. These voices in my head get loud and they keep telling me that I'm a fool for trusting in these wings. But maybe, baby, this will fly. All right, so that was kind of catastrophic. Um, <laughs> we lost the audio to a bunch of this episode and a couple episodes coming up. Mm. For some reason, the audio cut out on like half of the footage on one of our cameras. Never really, happened before. Really kind of a bummer. But we did want to wrap up everybody's favorite part about that museum. 
So what you guys just saw was that Corey had just asked me and the girls what our favorite parts were right in front of the monument, and we had really wonderful, great answers. Oh, yeah. So we're gonna because try to like. Because it was fresh like... in our minds, but now we're like, what the heck did we say? <laughs> All right, so the best that we can remember, my favorite part was that Wilbur and Orville's mother was super involved in all of her kids' lives. She was a mechanic. She taught them how to take things apart and put things back together. She had her own tools. She just was a really, really cool mom. Yeah. And I just thought that was really awesome. I mean, if your mom doesn't support you, I mean, what can you really accomplish? I mean, exactly. You can't really accomplish anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, my favorite part was that his whole, their f whole family just supported them through everything. Mm -hmm. And it was, they were such a big part of like how successful they actually were. I True. think my favorite part is that, I mean, like, they invented the plane. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> okay, everyone was helping everyone. The family helped, but also all of the locals came and helped them every time the plane either didn't work or just crashed, and they helped them bring them back up the dune every single time. I don't know if you see the theme, but it was support. So mm -hmm. support roles are massive. Like, what, what would they have done if they didn't have the support of their friends, family, and just random strangers, so. If you are ever in the Kitty Hawk area, we highly recommend going and seeing the Wright Brothers Museum. It was fantastic. Hopefully it'll be a little cooler than it was the day that we went because it was roasting while we were walking up yeah. to the monument. Um, but we really, really enjoyed it and it really led into everything that was coming next that we didn't yes. even know was coming. So after we left the Wright Brothers Museum, we went and checked into our campground, which was OBX Campground, such an awesome location right in the Kitty Hawk area. Yeah, so close. Uh, so like I mentioned before, my buddy Tom from the Navy from years and years ago, a good friend, uh, happened to be competing in this big yearly event. Unbelievable. This is the 50th annual hang gliding spectacular that happens in Kitty Hawk. And he just happened to be coming down from Virginia Beach with his two daughters at Jockey Ridge State Park just a few minutes away from our campground like I literally what are the odds it yeah is so no, crazy it's crazy yeah and here we are again um, we lost the audio so we're not nearly going to be able to represent this the way it really was mm -hmm. uh, my buddy Tom explained all the rules and what the event was about and and a bunch of stuff about you know hand gliding and about paragliding which is his main sport actually and recently he's in Austria paragliding um, just he's had some amazing stories which he shared which you cannot hear, unfortunately. After being at the Wright Museum and, and hearing about how they launch themselves off these dunes, yeah. to be able to go and watch these people. I'm actually glad I'm able to refilm my answer to the question because now I get to refilm it. Um, after experiencing that event, um, just seeing how hard it is with modern equipment yeah. to do that safely, to do it at all, and the fact that they did it a hundred years ago with half the technology is just astounding to me. And the other thing that was was uh, not really relevant or I didn't think about it, I just, I had visions of them, you know, safely gliding over dunes, you know, just a few feet off the ground. But these guys were hundreds of feet up in the air with no safety equipment. Nothing. Just, I guess I never really envisioned that and it's stupid to not, but you think about the whimsical things first and <laughs> Like it was safe. It was not safe at all. So many people died trying to do what they did. And my buddy, he crashed. Um, unfortunately, you saw that in the intro and, and you're gonna see it here again. But I actually think that it was my fault. If you see when he launches, I like push his uh, keel a little bit and I throw him off completely. Um, I feel really, <laughs> You bad. The thing that you will notice from like Tom's crash, and there was a ton of other crashes, like lots of people had crashed the whole time. Part of the story about why they came to the dunes in the first place a hundred years ago is because it was supposed to be softer. It's not a soft landing at yeah. all. It took serious guts. Like guts I don't even think exist anymore. It's crazy. <laughs> it's true. Um, and the other reason why they went to that area was just because of the seclusion. They did not want people technically spying on them. They wanted their ideas to be a secret. Incredible event. I love being surrounded by people that are passionate about what they do. And we're constantly trying to do that, to find those groups of people um, because it's really inspiring. So our day on the dunes was super hot. It hit over a hundred out there. So we had Tom and his girls come back to the RV, to the AC, and we ended up just spending the whole evening together. We grilled some chicken and some steaks, and it was just so incredible to reconnect with him after so many years. So we said goodbye to them, and in next week's episode, we are heading to Maine.